Greetings in the name of our risen Lord. Welcome to worship with St. Paul's in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where we join you not from the sanctuary located at 1340 3rd Avenue in Cedar Rapids, but indeed perhaps in God's original sanctuary in the beauty of creation, where we can hear the wind and a bird that flies through where we can see the green that is pushing up amidst the brown and where we greet you with love and care and welcome. We're glad that you're joining with us with worship today. Last week we celebrated the Easter message of good news and good new life. And so uh, in that uh, echo of that message, we are now in the season of Easter. And so for the next several weeks, we're beginning a worship theme called Grateful Life out of the good news of Easter. And so we're glad that you'll be a part of that with us. I have just a few announcements uh, as we begin this service. First of all, we want to invite you to participate in a hymn sing. That's right, you've often asked for singing your favorite hymns, and so we are going to make that happen. The first hymn sing will happen this coming Tuesday night at 515, and you'll be able to join us on Facebook Live and then actually make your requests live right in the comments section, 
and hopefully we'll be able to respond to as many of those as possible within the time that we have. So mark your calendar Tuesday 515. We'll see you on Facebook Live for that. We have our other weekday opportunities on uh, Monday at noon for Lexio Divina and Wednesday uh, Zoom Lexio Divina group as well as evening TGIW Live with Becca and Anna. And then Thursday mornings our morning prayer at 930. We want to um, make a special note about today. I mentioned that we're outside in this original sanctuary of God's. Uh, did you know that Earth Day is coming up? You may see it on the news that they are, uh, we are in a year of a 50th year anniversary of a first Earth Day. And this was a, a national celebration. It came from a, actually a, a senator from Wisconsin and noted that uh, we need to pay attention to our environment, our good earth. And so in 1970, this became this national day to pay attention to our environment. This is a, something that churches celebrate as well. And the United Methodist Church works with other churches ecumenically. And, and we have a festival of creation where we do bring uh, our prayers of joy and praise in the creation that God has given us. So. That's coming up April 22nd, and another reason why we find ourselves outdoors today as we approach that anniversary. After this worship service, if you have children and you would like to find some materials that might help your children embrace Earth Day and creation specifically, we invite you to take a look at our Facebook page, and there will be a post there created by Stephanie Hefner for the children. All right, uh, I'm, I'm ready to, to get worshiping here outside. Pastor Jonathan and I have uh, walked a path and have found ourselves out here, and it's a good place to be. So Pastor Jonathan and I are going to be leading worship, and we're glad that you're here with us. So um, I invite us into a time as we center our hearts on God. Our call to worship today comes from the great poet and agrarian Wendell Berry. This is his poem called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars, waiting with their light for a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Let us pray. Creator God, we praise you for your steadfast love for all that you have created. Give us eyes to see the world as you see it and to revel in its unrivaled beauty and to lament its current brokenness. May these sacred encounters draw us closer to you and push us further out of our comfort zones to work and act on behalf of all that you have created. Amen. As I grab my guitar, you should know St. Paul's is known quite well for our music program, and this ain't that, so you'll have to bear with me. But we couldn't figure out a way to get the organ all the way out here, so we'll be singing the hymn for the beauty of the earth, the first three stanzas.
Our scripture lesson today is from Genesis chapter 2, selected verses. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth and before any field crops grew, because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all of the fertile land. The Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human he had formed. And in the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruits. And he also grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden. A river flows from Eden to water the garden. And from there, it divides into four headwaters. The Lord God took the human and settled him in the garden of Eden to farm it and to take care of it. And then the Lord God said, It's not good that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. And the human gave each living being its name. The human named all the livestock all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But a perfect helper for him was nowhere to be found. So the Lord God put the human into a deep and heavy sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh over it. And with the rib taken from the human, the Lord God fashioned a woman and brought her to the human being. The two of them were naked, the man and his wife, but they weren't embarrassed. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. And our gospel lesson this morning comes from John's gospel, the 20th chapter. Mary Magdalene stood outside near the tomb, crying. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb she saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The angel asked her, Woman, why are you crying? She replied, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have put him. As soon as she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks. Be to God. Let us join together in prayer. Creating God for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. We lift our songs of grateful praise. Amen. Creation stories are incredibly powerful. Religions all over the world have one. And for us, the creation story at the very front of our Bible frames how we can understand the entire Bible. It's the narrative in, in our scriptures of creation through new creation, with, of course, lots of detours, misguided excursions, and wrong turns between the creation bookends. But creation stories aren't necessarily powerful because they pin down all of the biological facts just right. No, that, 
That isn't really what they're even trying to do. But rather, creation stories are so incredibly powerful because they keep drawing us back to the deepest and the most profound truths. The ones like the answers to the questions of who are we? Why are we here? What is here anyway? What is this place? Does anything or anyone order the world? And when we get off track or lose our way, our creation stories help us find the way back. For a number of reasons, now is a, a pretty good time in the life of humanity, for Christians, for people of faith, to revisit our creation stories. But not all ways of reading these stories are created equal. Some have read the creation story in Genesis chapter 1, and then they've fixated on and capitalized upon this little line that God spoke to the first humans. God said, Subdue the earth and have dominion over everything that moves on the earth. It isn't hard to see incredible and vast injustice that has been done to all of creation in the name of subduing and having dominion. I'll refrain from giving too many examples as I suspect that we're at a place in our shared lives that we need more gentleness than forthrightness right now. But if, e if each of us were to look with honest eyes at our own lives, we could probably find among our habits and spending practices actions that harm the earth and those who are in it. So many of our modern practices, our habits and public policies, or, or lack thereof sometimes, seem to assume that creation is ours to do with it as we please. Subdue and have dominion, we heard God say. People of faith need to revisit and reclaim our creation story. We need to go back to the source. We need to read it with fresh eyes. At least, if nothing else, we need to reconsider what God might have meant by subdue and have dominion. But we also have another way of getting back to the heart of the matter. We can literally turn the page to tell another creation story. In Genesis chapter 2, scholars mostly agree that this recounting of creation, this narrative of creation's uh, existence, has a different author than Genesis chapter 1. And the focus and the concerns there are quite different than in Genesis 1 as well. Genesis 2 is far less interested in humans as the pinnacle of the created hierarchy of the good things that God made, but rather humans are created into mutual interdependence with all the things that God has made. It's a much more earthy kind of story in Genesis 2. There, the human was enlivened at the point that, div uh, that, that dirt was fashioned and divine breath was breathed into it. And in Genesis 2, God only created the earth at the same time that God intended to create the human, because God created them for one another. The human to tend and care for the earth, and the earth to sustain the human. Genesis 2 is a story of interdependence and deep, deep connections. And the mutuality of it all goes, goes much deeper. In this creation story, God made animals from the same kind of earthy soil as the human and also created them for relationship with one another. And the human was the one who God gave the task of naming the animals. We might consider the kind of relationship that exists between those who name and those who are named. Think about the connections that you have with maybe something you've named 
or someone you've named. A child, maybe a song you wrote, a poem, a book, a project, a, a, a new ministry. Whatever it is that you've given a name to, that act of naming something or someone begets deep relationships. And the creation that God made was not simply about utility and sustaining a dull kind of life. As Pastor Sherry read for us, God created this world full of beauty. The trees were not just uh, utilitarian, but they had beauty. God created them beautiful. As we sang in For the Beauty of the Earth, this creation is a gift for ear and eye, for the heart and mind's delight, for the mystic harmony linking sense to sound and sight. Creation is a place of enjoyment and beauty for the senses. Now, while the animals were not a suitable companion who could share in the intimacy of body and soul and language, God created another human for companionship. And while this relationship might be deeper than the one between the, the first human and the animals, interdependence is, is still a crucial detail of the story. The one comes from the ribs of the other, and the human from which the other came would always be incomplete without the interdependence of this companion. And we have to read on in the story beyond the point where we stopped. But this beautiful, harmonious creation was the setting. It was the context, the place where the humans walked with God in the cool of the day. A bit like today, quite frankly. If that names something of your deepest longing, this creation story of interdependence, which is, after all, what creation stories do best. There, be, there may be no better way to mend our relationship with God's creation and to find our right place within it than to notice the earth with a new kind of gratitude for the ways that it hospitably sustains us. And this creation story, the one from Genesis chapter 2, might even breathe a new kind of life into our, our dusty Ash Wednesday message. You are dust, and to dust you shall return, we say. We might see, though, in that message something more than just our fragility or our mortality. Our fragile, dusty nature could be for us a reminder of how deeply connected we are to one another and to all of creation. That might be exactly the kind of message that we need in a time where we have to keep our distance for one another's safety. We are connected, deeply, deeply connected. However, e even though it may seem like we're living in the midst of a never-ending Lenten season, we're not. Today is actually the, the second Sunday of Easter. We're not in Lent anymore, thanks be to God. This is the time of the risen Christ. And just a little bit ago in our, in our service here, we heard the Gospel of John's record of the events that took place after the resurrection of Jesus. After Mary Magdalene found the stone removed and Jesus gone, she, she went to report this seeming robbery to the disciples who came with her and investigated and returned home. But Mary lingered at the tomb. Deep mourning has a way of taking us back to the place where our loved one should be. And there, as she was lingering at the tomb, Mary Magdalene was met by angels before she turned around and faced the risen Lord. But Mary didn't realize that it was her risen Lord who was standing in front of her. She assumed him to be the gardener until Jesus spoke to her and she recognized him. Mary, he said, and she responded, Rabboni, it means teacher. 
It's a beautiful story indeed. It's a, a beautiful recognition and a moment of deep intimacy. Teacher, she said. But I would also say, I'd also ask, is there something special for us today if we go back to Mary's first thought about Jesus? Sure, we could say when, when Mary called him the gardener that she was mistaken in the most natural, commonsensical way. After all, the tomb was in a garden. Anyone she didn't recognize there, she might assume, oh, well, this might be the gardener. But we are people with a creation story. And so was Mary Magdalene. And this encounter is, is a rather significant one in the grand scheme of the Bible's story. Remember the story from creation through to new creation. The one that started in a garden. Can you imagine with me that just possibly Mary Magdalene might have seen in the eyes of the risen Jesus glimpses of the harmonious garden life that God had always intended for people to live. Now, I don't know, maybe that's a bit too playful for your comfort, but who would disagree with this, that Jesus calls us to an abundant life of peace and harmony, the kind of life found in grateful interdependence with one another, with the plants and the animals, with all of God's good creation. It's good, like Mary, to call Jesus teacher, but I think it's also good for us today to also say, my risen Lord, gardener of the Eden God intended for us. Amen. You know, when... Uh, coronavirus concerns hit our shores um, and really started to disrupt our lives here in Cedar Rapids and, and at St. Paul's. Pastor Sherry and I started having some conversations um, about pastoring in a time like this. Neither one of us has, has ever been in, any, in anything quite like this before. And we started talking about the kinds of things that that we would want to offer to you as a congregation. And one of the very first things that Pastor Sherry said to me, I, I remember this vividly. We were in the office in the, in the open area. She said, people are going to need to get outside. It will be so important. And so Pastor Sherry, as you're here, I'm gonna jump off the screen, but wonder if you would just talk about that a little bit with, with us this morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for your message, Pastor Jonathan. Um, first of all, it's just really good to be outside today. <laughs> uh, this is really good. I've been taking some, some pictures as I've been out here and just um, enjoying it. Why did I say that it would be important to get outside? I think um, it probably struck me on several different levels. Growing up, I was a girl that probably was found to be in the house a lot more than outside. <laughs> but that has certainly changed over, over the years. You know, I think the first thing that I might have been thinking about was, of all the places that we can't go and we can't be with people, one place that we can go is out our front door if we're physically able to do so. Um, those of us that have that ability that we can actually go outside and it's a place that a lot of times is taken for granted and we don't see it we don't appreciate it we don't notice it and I was also thinking of just the physical aspect of getting some exercise moving around and um, being physically active that if indeed we're able to be physically active that that is going to be important for our well-being uh, over these weeks that are turning into months that we don't know really what the timeline will be on this. But I was also thinking about times that I have been outside and in nature um, where God truly has, um, has, has communicated with me. So in one way, when you are outside, there is just a unique way of seeing the praise of God and singing the praise of God and, and and being in the praise of God just 
in the beauty of nature. That is something that we are all drawn to naturally. Uh, that when we look at any good uh, design of anything, it comes from nature. And so this is the source of so much that we can see God's praise and God's work, and we can offer praise. The other thing that I think that can happen is if you linger a while outside, and you might think about even sitting, or maybe going for a contemplative walk, that you have your senses engage with nature's elements all around you. Um, my hair isn't looking so great today. <laughs> the wind is, is blowing just a little bit, and I can also feel the wind on my face. I can feel it when it's cold, and I can breathe it in my lungs, and I can know that I'm alive, and I can know the harshness sometimes of weather, of what it seems, but then I can also see places of newness, places of new life. And I know that in this season right now, when we are moving from winter into spring, oh my goodness, there are signs all around us that can be signs of good hope in the newness of life. So as the winds change and they become mild, and as the green changes and, and the brown of the leaves start to move away, and as blossoms start to open up, all of those things are, it's just a bounty of, of hope in the seasons. And as we stand, as we go on any kind of walk, um, connecting with the earth under our feet, actually thinking about us being connected to the good earth, that we indeed are one. We are connected and we are dependent on each other and we're dependent on all of all of humanity as well as all of God's creation that there in that um, comes a sense of assurance and a sense of eternity and a sense that we indeed travel through the ages together with all of God's creation so pastor Jonathan I don't I don't know those were several thoughts that came to mind as I was reflecting on just why it is so important that we can find ourselves outside. Just, just a rich place to be. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, we want to move our service uh, to a time of prayer. And um, so we'll have an opportunity for you to name prayers uh, in the comments uh, on our Facebook live stream. As we um, pray today, I would uh, name people that, that we are mindful of and aware that would be blessed with your prayers for healing and grace. Um, we named Charles Edwards, who has had a procedure this past week. We name Ann Emerson. We surround uh, Deb Miller in the loss of her husband, Jim Miller, who passed away this last week. Um, and Jim's sister, Barb Satcamp, and husband, Bill. We grieve with them. Our hearts break with them. Who else might you name before us today that we remember in our prayers? We remember and pray for our health care providers, our leaders in our country and our city in making decisions, for our church family that is scattered but still connected. We are finding new creative ways, uh, indeed, that we are the body of Christ and we do connect, if not physically in person, but we, um, we pray for all of us in this disoriented time. We pray for those who are um, struggling with mental health and the challenge that this disruption is playing in their life. We pray for the safety of all, the safety for our children, the safety for our families, the safety for those that may be without a home in these days. Who else might you name in our prayers? Let's pray together. God, creator of all things, you've invited us into this sanctuary and we sit and we simply are still. And we hear your praises being sung through the rustling, rustling of leaves on a tree, 
a bird that enters in, the deers that group and peek through the tree branches, the wind on our face. And we thank you, Lord, for a place of peace and for this fresh air. We thank you for your creation and we pray for all who will be gathering this week to celebrate your earth, that we may have a festival in our hearts and in our actions, centering around your good creation, that we might become more aware of each other and of all things, and our dependence on the earth, on the trees, the leaves, the things that are green, all that gives breath. Lord, you have created us for each other. And so hear the prayers on our hearts as we long to reach out to one another in our faith community, in our families who are separated, and in our world, who pause now in concerns of a pandemic that has shaken us. Lord, restore the solid foundation on which we stand. Allow us to remember that we stand on holy ground as we stand with you. And allow us to gather our voices and pray the prayer that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, here we are. We have moved, as you can see, from a bench to this location. And we invite you to, to move now as well. Uh, we come to this time in our service where we invite your participation through generous acts of of love and gratitude for the gifts that God has given us. And so we invite you to offer those financial gifts which support the ministries of Jesus Christ through St. Paul's and through the United Methodist Church, either through our church app, through our website, or through the mail. Thank you for your generous um, ways of giving as an act of trust and love to God. We also come to this time in our service where uh, it is a favorite act of love, and that is where we offer signs of peace and reconciliation to one another. Imagine you are sitting next to or near those that are familiar to you, and you're able to offer signs of peace and reconciliation. Let's do that now in the comment section and know that indeed, even though we are separated geographically, we indeed are together. It's the body of Christ that comes in this place for forgiveness and for love. Peace of Christ be with you, Pastor John. And also with you, Amen. and peace to all of you. As we conclude our service, um, if you've been out to Prairie Woods and you ventured around the, the grounds here, the woods here, you may be familiar with Grandmother Oak. This is this magnificent tree that has been in the background from a closer distance for our whole service. Um, when we started thinking about this service and places we were grateful for, my mind immediately went to Grandmother Oak. Um, as we started thinking about our creation stories and the kind of interdependence and the kind of care and hospitality that this whole planet is, Grandmother Oak seemed to be telling me that very story of dependence and care. She's a home for animals. She's a place for travelers to come and rest. In the summer, there will be leaves there that will provide shade. This is how we are called to be in this world. If you're able to venture out here, I encourage you to come and stop by. But 
If this is too far off the beaten path and not accessible, there are other places in, in nature that um, can tell similar stories, and we encourage you to go hear them, to listen for them. We're going to sing our last song, and uh, you're not going to see us. I'm going to step off the camera, and we're going to let you uh, consider Grandmother Oak as we sing the trees of the field. So go in peace. God bless you. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy. All the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field. I'm Stephanie. Did you know that Wednesday, April 22nd is Earth Day? All over the world, people are celebrating our home planet and sharing how we can help take care of it. In the church, you might have heard that we are stewards of the Earth. One way to look at that is being like a gardener. A gardener plants seeds, waters, weeds, and watches over a garden to help it flourish, whether it is a flower garden for beauty or a vegetable garden for food. In gardening, we don't create the seeds or the water or the nutrients or microbes in the soil. Everything comes from God, and without God's nurture, nothing would be, and nothing could grow. St. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, it is not the gardeners with their planting and watering who count, but God who makes it grow. We are fellow workers in God's great garden, and we are also a part of the garden. We are part of nature and we have a responsibility to keep it clean and healthy, not take more than we need, and to help keep it in balance and to try to stop it from getting out of balance. To do that, I think the first step is to get to know nature. You are invited to enjoy and delight in God's garden. Remember to be mindful of social distancing practices, but if you have a yard or a nearby green space, where you can safely go, go and find a spot where you can sit a while. Spend some time there and listen to what you can hear. Are there birds singing? Can you feel the wind? What can you see? Maybe at first glance, it looks just like grass. But if you look closely, maybe there are other kinds of plants or bugs or worms. If you can, revisit that spot at other times and notice the things that change over time. I'd love it if you could share in the comments or have your parents share a photo of your favorite spot or something you found in nature. Let's pray. Creator God, we along with all of creation praise you for your wonderful world. We thank you for the beauty of nature, 
for the way that it provides us with everything we need. Please help us to take care of it. Let the mountains and hills sing for you, and the trees of the field clap their hands. Amen.